Good evening and welcome again to Focus on Indianapolis Sports. And I'm your host, Mill Thompson. And as I promised you last week, we're going to have a special show talking about the Special Olympics. But before we get to that special feature, we're going to talk about the sports news. And what's at the top of the sports news? No more Yogi. Yogi is gone. That's right. George Steinbrenner's at it again out there with the New York Yankee Clubhouse antics. That's right. Yogi Berra was the head, co head coach and manager of the New York Yankees. But who could it be now? Lemon? No. Hauser? No, it is not Billy Bob. Billy, Billy Martin has been hired again. Hired, he's been, this is the fourth time, I believe, maybe the fifth time that Billy Martin, Martin's been at the helm of the New York Yankees. George Steinbrenner's going to give him one more shot at it. He's going to try to take the 6 and 10 Yankees and put them as contenders in the American League East. They're going to have a tough road to hoe because the top of the American League East, of course, the defending world champions, Detroit Tigers, the Baltimore Orioles, and Toronto Blue Jays are tied up in a log jam. And, of course, in the West California, my Chicago White Sox, who incidentally beat the New York Yankees uh, in a weekend series that caused Yogi Berra to go packing, along with Kansas City, are leading the West. And of course, in the National League, uh, National League East, we've got Montreal, your Cubbies, and my Mets. And when it comes down to the National League West, we've got San Diego Padres are hanging in there. Los Angeles, Cincinnati, and Houston, they're all hanging in there pretty tough. In fact, there's nobody in the National League West that's more than three games out of first place. And we've got to look to auto racing very quickly. We've got Harry Gant. Yes, Harry Gant, the Skull Bandit, he won out there, the NASCAR Grand Nationals. And, of course, right here at our Indy 500, the month of May is starting to get flashy, starting to open up. The cars are starting to rumble. The rookie tests just completed this past weekend for a few new rookies. Uh, one big news story there, of course, Willie Ribs, the first black driver to uh, make an effort at the uh, Indianapolis 500, withdrew. He took a couple of laps, about 170 miles an hour, said he didn't have enough time. He, he breathed very deeply, swallowed hard, and said, maybe next year these cars are going a little bit quickly. I need some oval experience and some champ car experience before he uh, gives another shot. And we've got a look at golf, and that's Ray Floyd. He wins the Houston Open with a 277. Hey, that's about $90,000 for the first place trophy. Congratulations, Ray Floyd. He's back at it again. And we've got to talk about the NBA and our playoffs because we had our predictions with our special guest last week, Ray Tolbert. Uh, and we both uh, kind of came out on top when we picked Denver over San Antonio. Antonio. So Denver is going to be in the uh, uh, Western Division Finals against Utah, who upset Houston. And both of us picked Houston, so neither of us were too victorious in that pick. And then the other ones opening up the second round of the playoffs, none of them were very close games, none of them very exciting games, except if you were with the run and gun teams. Of course, Boston destroyed Detroit, Philly destroyed Milwaukee, and LA routed Portland. I hope these games are going to get closer before we get to the finals or we're going to be talking more baseball than basketball. And finally, with the Indianapolis Checkers, they finally lost to Peoria. Fred Creighton um, from the front office to coaching to hiring another coach back to the front office, back to another head coach. They better get ready for their second IHL season. I've got to talk real briefly. I said finally, but I'm going to talk about the NFL draft only because of our Indianapolis Colts. They're number five in the, in the draft that goes Tuesday morning. I think they're probably going to get some help at offensive tackle and perhaps at wide receiver, depending upon what happens with the other four picks ahead of them. We know what's already happened with one of the picks ahead of them. Bernie Kosar, yes, Bernie Kosar has decided to go into the supplementary draft. To make a long story short, what that means is the Houston Oilers won't have a shot at him, but his own Cleveland Browns will, the team he wants to play with. Chances are, the possibilities are, the Houston Oilers may file suit against who? Pete Rozelle? He's never had a lawsuit filed against him. Uh, ask Al Davis. Anyway, that's what's going to happen in the world of the NFL draft. I look for the Colts to get some immediate help. We'll come back and talk about the Special Olympics right after these special words. I've seen some great moves on the basketball court, but none as great as the one you can make right now by getting involved with your local Special Olympics program for the mentally handicapped. You'll be helping nearly 20,000 athletes in Indiana like my friends Jerome and Sherry experience the joy of sports. Now where can they call for more information about Special Olympics? 1-800-742-0612. And welcome back to Focus on Indianapolis Sports. What I was telling you about today's show is going to be special and special in a lot of ways, particularly because we're talking about Special Olympics. 
And we're going to have with us today our special guest, the Communications Director of the Indiana Special Olympics, David Roundsley. David, welcome to Focus on Indianapolis Sports. Thank you very much, Milt. Well, I tell you, we can talk a lot about Special Olympics, but we're going to do uh, most of it in the context of a film clip here. And it's going to take about 13 minutes or so. Then when we finish that up, we'll come back and talk specifically about the Special Olympics. How about joining us and watching the special feature? Okay, I love watching it every time I've seen it, and I'd love to see it again. Well, let's get our audience involved. The Special Olympics. Watched intently from the aging concrete stands as bands played, balloons flew, and a new flag was raised. A flag signifying the end of a dream, the beginning of a reality. And later, a lone athlete would round the track carrying with him a torch in the manner of the ancient Olympic Games. That day, the torch had a special significance, for it had taken the bearers centuries to win the right to carry it. The athlete was mentally handicapped, and these were the first Special Olympics Games. In 1968, the opening ceremonies were a declaration. In 1983, they were a celebration. A celebration of the new life Special Olympics has given the mentally handicapped, their families, and everyone they have touched. Over 65,000 people filled Tiger Stadium in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, not for a football game or a concert, but to share the joy 4,300 athletes from over 50 countries would experience in the next five days. Before Special Olympics, the mentally handicapped had only been able to watch others compete. This week, others would watch them. The athletes had dreamed long and worked hard. Now they would have the opportunity to see their training pay off. Some would win medals, but all would win. The International Special Olympics are held once every four years. This is the story of the 1983 Games. An inspiration and a celebration. sees wide world of sports, a rare opportunity to share the joy of the Special Olympics. The next day we found 14-year-old Shelly Dumas at the starting line of her 200-meter dash. Hi, Daddy! This is for you! I'm gonna win! The runners anxiously awaited the crack of the starter's pistol. We should mention here that each race is a final. Every competitor is ranked on the basis of their qualifying times at the state games and placed in a division with others of the same sex, age, and athletic ability. This gives everyone a chance to win. But the theme of the games is clear. Winning is important, but having the skill and courage to finish is a victory. There's Chelly in lane two on the right of your screen. She will finish third and proudly take home a bronze medal to her dad. Woo! 
You okay? You okay? In the nose and out the mouth. In the nose and out the mouth. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Daddy, I did it! Yeah! Yeah! All right. Chelly Dumas, another winner at the International Special Olympics. If there ever was any doubt as to the intensity of the competition in the Special Olympics, one merely has to observe the start line or arena at the outset of an event. Tina Dirksen is 19 years old. She's moments away from a once undreamed of happening. She's in the 50 meter dash of the International Special Olympics, awaiting the call of her name. Lane six, 19 year old Tina Dirksen, Massachusetts. on the line. The field is set. She'll do her best. That's all they want. Her coaches, her family, all her friends. Tina will be okay. The same determination to excel is international in nature. Masaki Takanuma sprawled to a first place in the 200 meters and took the gold. The performances at Baton Rouge were often spectacular. Here's 16-year-old Kenny Green from Louisiana. 53.5 for the 400 meters. And how about Loretta Claiborne? She turned the mile in a spectacular 542.7. Loretta's 29 from Pennsylvania. Here's double gold medal winner 15-year-old Paulette Tibbs of Louisiana. She had the best time for the 200 meters, her time 28.3. Her twin brother Paul also claimed a pair of gold medals in the 200 and 50 meter dashes. Oh, each of you got two medals, Paulette and Paul. Uh, you guys help each other train. Paul, do you help your sister? Uh-uh. <laughs> Paulette, do you help Paul? No. Do you like Paul? Uh-uh. <laughs> do you like Paulette? I ain't trained myself. You're training for yourself, huh? Uh-huh. Are you really proud of your medals? Yes, oh, yeah. Yeah. Have you trained hard for this? Yes, sir. And you don't get along that well? No. <laughs> oh, I bet you do, though, really. Mm -mm. Congratulations, guys. It was great. Four gold medals between you. That's sensational. Paul and Paulette. Here's another pair of twins from Norway. The lookalikes both competed in the 50-meter dash in the standing long jump. Toril had a sixth place finish in the long jump. Svan Hill had a fourth place. Anthony Francis from Kentucky reached way out for his standing long jump. And yeah, he liked it. Some of the athletes, like Ralph Van Cleek from New Jersey, were stunned by the crowd and their surroundings. Ralph had entered the 400 meters, but he had second thoughts. And then when the gun sounded, with Ralph's parents, brother, and two sisters looking on, Ralph was left at the start line. Ralph was hesitant, perhaps concerned. Could he make it? He had done it before, but never before all these strangers. At the end of the race, Jean-Francois Dufay of Belgium was the winner. In good time. Meanwhile, Ralph was far up the track. Eighth place in an eight-man field. But the realization had set in. Ralph knew he could make it, and he would make it. It will be easier next time for Ralph. Perhaps so will many other tasks he once thought were impossible. The stadium is filled with 65,000 people here for the opening ceremonies of the 1983 International Special Olympics. Now the stadium is empty. The games are over. The people have gone. But the spirit remains. What we have tried to document for you today here on Wide World of Sports is the almost unbelievable story of the Special Olympics. True, it is indeed a story of sport, but it far transcends the mere winning or losing, time and distance, the traditional ways of measuring accomplishment. When one watches a struggling Special Olympian reaching out just to finish a race,
fighting to overcome the unasked for impairment of mind and body, there comes an overwhelming realization that yes, this is a competition, and perhaps in the truest sense of the word. But more than that, this is an affair of the heart. These athletes have trained for weeks, months, years to live up to the Special Olympics creed, to be brave in the attempt. At the finish line, there are no agents, lawyers, signing bonuses, but there are the loving arms of the hundreds of thousands of volunteers that are now growing worldwide. And what are the parents and families of these athletes? In many cases, the embarrassment and despair they might have felt not that many years ago has been replaced with a deep sense of pride and joy. A natural pride in their loved one's dedication, courage, and accomplishment. And a joy in witnessing the wonderful triumph of the human spirit that all of us have shared here in Baton Rouge. We'll never forget it. We hope you don't. Very special and warm piece on the Special Olympics. David Roundsley, Communications Director of Indiana Special Olympics. Tell us a little bit about the objective of Special Olympics. Well, Milt, Special Olympics really has two objectives. First of all, obviously, is the sports programs. The, the um, ability to compete in sports and the opportunities that these athletes get come mostly from the Special Olympics. There really aren't that many programs out there for the, for the physical involvement and the training and such. Um, but on another level, Special Olympics tries very hard, and it really is a primary objective to get these people involved in, in normal activities. They go to an event, they stay there overnight, they go and eat in restaurants, and the social interaction and the confidence they get from, from just being involved and participating is really a very important part of Special Olympics. Requirements for being a Special Olympian? Well, the, the primary requirement, of course, is that you're mentally handicapped, which by definition is an IQ of 75 or less. 
Um, a lot of people seem to think Special Olympics is just for kids, and that's very, not, very much not the case. Special Olympics is eight years old and above. I was just uh, doing entry forms for our state summer games this week, and we came across an athlete from uh, Shelbyville who is 74 years old. So that's very much uh, open-ended with, uh, with the age there. How many people do you serve? Well, I mentioned the state summer games. That's our, our big event every year, and we have 2,600 athletes competing at that. They qualified for there by competing in area games, track and field, swimming, gymnastics, and there were 6,000 who competed in those area games that are going on right now, as a matter of fact, around the state. Um, all sports together, we figure we probably serve about 20,000 mentally handicapped people in the state. What about nationally? What's the dichotomy between state and the national progression? Well, I'd say national. I think that Special Olympics is very much international organization. We have programs in about 50 countries worldwide now. And the figure that they're using now for worldwide is a million participants during this last year. That's a goal that they've been reaching for for some time. And after only, I think, 16 years of Special Olympics, I think a million competitors is, is really a, a great figure. Here in the United States, um, we account for most of that. Obviously, this is where the program started. And, and we in Indiana like to think we have a very strong program, one of the strongest and largest in the country. How is it supported, David? Well, Special Olympics is supported entirely through contributions by business and individuals in Indiana. We don't receive any government support. We don't receive any large uh, support from any organization or anything like that. It's all the generosity of the people here in Indiana. And I have to say they do a, a tremendous job of supporting us, and we're thankful to every one of them. I noticed in our public service announcement that uh, local Pacer favorite uh, Clark Kellogg. Uh, um, you, do you use celebrities to help promote? Yeah, we, we, we try to use celebrities. We try to use celebrities who are really honestly interested in helping the program. Clark and the Pacers are just, are just super about that. Uh, Special Olympics is the official charity of the NBA, and, and the Pacers have really taken a lot of energy to get involved. And, and Clark has a real personal interest in the athletes, and he's done a, a number of things. Um, the Colts have also you know, picked up the ball on that. Rod Dauhauer is our honorary head coach for 1985, just as Clark was last year. And a number of, of other Indiana celebrities. We have Bobby Knight and Gene Cady have done a lot of work for us. Mike Warren from Hill Street Blues from, from South Bend is, has done a number of things. So we try to encourage them to get involved, and, and we've had a very positive response from them. I understand in 1987 there's going to be a special Olympic major event. Yes, very major for the state of Indiana. It's the 1987 International Special Olympic Games are going to be held in South Bend. The, the film we just saw was in the 1983 International Games in Baton Rouge. And this event is going to encompass well over 4,000 athletes. Tens of thousands of volunteers will be involved by the time it's over. And it's really an exciting event. Um, Indiana, as the host state, there will be a number of athletes for, from all over the state, probably you know, well into the hundreds, who will have the opportunity to compete there. So we consider it an honor, and it's something we're going to really uh, go after well. David, if folks want to get involved and help with this volunteer effort of the Special Olympics, where do they contact? Well, what we always try to do, the, the real roots of Special Olympics are at the local level. That's where, where most of the programs are run. Um, that's where all the volunteers are. Thing like. We very much encourage you to get involved in the local Special Olympic program here in Marion County, around Indianapolis, and here for the people watching this show. We have a state office in Terre Haute um, that oversees the activities of the whole state. Um, you saw before with the Clark Kellogg piece with the phone number, 1-800. 742-0612, and uh, if you give us a call there or contact local program, we'll be more than happy to get you involved. Well, now you've seen it and you've heard it from the uh, Communications Director of Indiana Special Olympics, David Roundsley. David, thank you for coming down and sharing this special event with us on Focus on Indianapolis Sports. Uh, thank you for having me, Mel. Now it's a time in our show when we get you, the audience, the opportunity for participation. And, of course, we do that in the form of our trivia questions. And last week, our special guest was Ray Tolbert, a professional basketball player. And, of course, the trivia questions surrounded uh, Mr. Tolbert. So let's see how your answers stacked up against last week's trivia questions. Question number one, Ray Tolbert was Mr. Basketball in Indiana in what year? 1977, he nudged out Drake Morris for the Mr. Basketball uh, honor. Question number two, where did Ray Tolbert play high school basketball? He, of course, played at uh, Madison Heights and Anderson, Anderson, Madison Heights. Question number three, Ray Tolbert played for the Seattle Supersonics, true or false? That's true, he was not drafted by them, but played the majority of his first year with the Seattle Supersonics. Question number four, in what year was Ray Tolbert the Big Ten's most valuable player? Ironically, 1981, he was the MVP's uh, most valuable player, but was not on the all-Big uh, all Ten team. 
And finally, question five, Ray Tolbert played in the Pan Am Games, true or false? That's absolutely correct. He did play in the Pan Am Games back in 1979. Now, this week's trivia questions are going to surround the Special Olympics. So if you've got your papers and pencils and uh, ready to go and you can answer all five of these questions correctly, you're going to get a couple of tickets to a local sporting event. And our first trivia question this week, how many athletes participate in the Indiana Special Olympics Summer Games? Question number two, where will the 1987 International Special Olympics Summer Games be held? Question two, who was the 1984 head coach for the Special Olympics? Question four, in what month is the Special Olympics held? And finally, question five, who will the honorary head coach be for 1985 games? If you've got all five of those answers correct, and you're the first to get them to me, Milt Thompson, in care of the programming department of Indianapolis Cablevision, that's 5330 East 65th Street here in Indianapolis, Indiana, 46220, I'll send you out two tickets to a local sporting event. Well, for you participants, I'm going to give you the opportunity to view those questions one more time. Question number one, how many athletes participate in the Indiana Special Olympics Summer Games? Question two, where will the 1987 International Special Olympics Summer Games be held? Question three, who was the 1984 head coach for the Special Olympics? Question four, in what month is the Special Olympics held? And finally, question five, who will be the honorary head coach for the 1985 Special Olympics? If you've got all five of those answers correct and you're the first one to get them all correct, down to me, Milt Thompson, in care of the programming department of Indianapolis Cablevision. That's 5330 East 65th Street here in Indianapolis, Indiana, 46220. You'll receive two tickets to a local sporting event. We've been with our special guest, Dave Roundsley, of the, the communications director of the Indiana Special Olympics, and we look forward to seeing you next week for Focus on Indianapolis Sports.